So anyway, like I, you know, you, you saw there, we're going to show a bit of the video later in the in the conversation uh, about where we were this weekend and and kind of what motivated the CR Club to join many many other organizations, including the diocese down there in Mission, to stand against the border wall. Um, but uh, obviously, the, the the conversation tonight. And let's see if we can get the PowerPoint back to. Uh, it's just uh, environmental justice, and I think everyone, a lot of you guys in here have rough understanding or you've read definitions or uh, experienced it, been on the front lines of some of these struggles. Um, but, um, to the, yeah, so there's, there's, there's varying, evolving, and sometimes conflicting definitions about what we mean when we talk about environmental justice. Uh, I just grabbed a few today when I was preparing um, some of the, the PowerPoint, uh, and, and pretty traditionally, like when the when the EPA says environmental justice, they're they're kind of honing in on two points, uh, and they talk about the fair treatment and meaningly meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, or national origin. Uh, so the key elements are involvement, you know, and equity that was what they tend to stress. There's a there's a critique around that where, you know, you you, you factor in environmental racism, the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards borne by uh, typically disempowered uh, communities and people of color. We've got some case studies that we'll get into here today. Obviously the borderlands is 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 an excellent one um, to discuss. We'll try to keep our talk fairly short. I'm thinking maybe 40 minutes with a couple short videos, and then just open up for conversation because I think the most fruitful atmosphere for these kinds of discussions is when things are open and when people are talking, if not having a multi-day workshop to um, to dig into the the nuts and bolts here. But oftentimes, environmental justice is translated in kind of a policy setting as environmental equity. And uh, so when, when organizations uh, or agencies like the EPA talk about equity, fair treatment, and meaningful involvement, uh, a lot of times they're missing um, what some talk about when they talk about abolishing injustice. You know, we don't want to simply redistribute environmental harm, right? We don't want to move it and say, we all take a fair share. I talked with a friend of mine in Alpine when we were going down to fight the, the pipelines down there. and. There is these mixed feelings among long, long-time environmentalists saying, "Well, you know, the Permian Basin has been punched, you know, punched through so for so many years, and the, the the harm that people suffer in those environments is such that why shouldn't we bear a fair share?" Um, well, this isn't something we just want to redistribute. These are these are these are extractive industries, these are polluting industries that we want to shut down. We want to eliminate harm and, and eliminate risk as much as possible. Uh, one of the um, so anyway, this is Manchester and Houston. If you're not familiar, I'd encourage anybody to Google the, the struggle over there. This is um, in highly impacted, one of the probably the most polluted uh, areas in the country. Uh, and I got this from Earth Justice, and I think their statistics are good as of uh, maybe three years ago when they talk about 114,000 pounds of toxic <coughs> air pollutants being released by these refineries and chemical plants there. Obviously very, very close to the Manchester neighborhood uh, uh, in Houston. Um, but I went back also a little bit. Uh, environmental justice as a concept was really forming up, you know, uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and some of the, the principles enshrined, let's say 1991, there was the Multinational People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. And they put together 17 points uh, that were really, really formative for then future uh, conversation and development. And, they, they recognized first, you know, obviously our relationship with, with Mother Earth you know, is vital and, and critical, and that's the cornerstone of all of this work. Uh, they also recognized 500 years of genocide and the, the, um, the critical nature of addressing that and trying to, trying to turn, turn, that, turn that tide. Um, but when they, when they talk about, among their principles, they did talk about, one, what I was just describing was just ending the production and, and, and release of toxic pollutants. They don't want to just move, move it around. Uh, they, they define environmental justice 
to include full compensation and reparation for the harms that have been suffered, historical harms. Uh, and they build their argument also on international um, treaties and declarations such as the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the UN Convention on Genocide. So uh, they really get uh, deep into the law and, uh, and it's from that kind of declaration in 91 that a lot of this conversation got underway and was informed. Um, if you would flip me a, a page. Um, are we going to do that video here? I don't remember which. This is yours. That's the, um, so we added this video here just um, to share that environmental justice comes as a result of injustices that are going on. So it's a, a direct response to existing injustices. Um, Kind of, um, yeah, but this is a it's short, and so it kind of set set the tone, set the scene <laughs> yes. for y'all. And then deeper in, we'll get into the the wall and some video we brought back from the wall, the wall to be. I've is got it the. Possible to dim the light slightly. Dim the light slightly. <laughs> Somebody can know some more about that yeah. than, than I do. Let me get the. So we saw an example of Houston. This is an example of um, <coughs> Dallas and the work that's been going on. organization and many, many others is recognizing um, that communities uh, have been struggling for a long time uh, with these issues, that they're not something that's new uh, at all. Uh, it, but I thought what, what might be useful uh, to, to bring this message uh, is really just to discuss our life stories a little bit and briefly and for myself, 
Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Greg Harmon. Uh, as of two months ago, I've been organizing as a clean air organizer here in San Antonio. Prior to that, since about 1998, my introduction here, uh, I've worked as a journalist, primarily in Texas, but also in Nevada and Mississippi. Uh, and so I had concepts, I guess. I understood that there was injustice, you know, in the world, and I had these ideas of you know, um, of oppression and, and, and some of this, but I had never really, I think for myself, been up face to face with it uh, before until I moved to West Texas. And some of the first uh, articles I began writing, uh, just coincidentally, I didn't go out there to do environmental journalism. I didn't know I was gonna get sucked into this particular path to uh, environmental racism, environmental justice struggles um, consistently and increasingly over the years. Uh, but uh, two things were happening. One, there we were sitting at a crossroads for nuclear waste disposal. There was the WIP isolation, the waste isolation pilot plan, a federal uh, site in the corner of southeast New Mexico. And there was an effort then to, uh, by the state, Texas, Maine, and Vermont, uh, we were under compact to take all the low-level waste, primarily from reactors, uh, some from hospitals, but primarily reactor waste. Uh, and bury it. And so where that went was West Texas uh, to a town called Sierra Blanca, which is three quarters uh, Latino, Latina, and very, very poor. Uh, they got some money out of it, some courtship, uh, and ultimately though it was fought off and privatized and that has since gone uh, up to Andrews. So there's um, some private entities that have been working that. but. While I was in Odessa, I, I actually was the regional reporter, so I was covering like 13 counties, and I got to bounce around and do what I want, whether it was the balloon festival, you know, in Alpine, or tracking bears in Big Bend, or going up to, you know, looking at, at, at uh, uh, riots in the jails in, in Reeves, in uh, Pecos, uh, Texas, or, uh, you know, any number of things. Uh, but I happened to be in the office one day uh, when the, one of the uh, petrochemical plants began to smoke. And uh, the city reporter was out sick that day. Uh, and so I was tapped, you know, to figure out, find out what was going on and report on the situation. Well, it was uh, Huntsman Polymers plant, a plastics plant up there. And what I found, you know, the event itself was, was really a travesty and, a, and a, an offense uh, in so many ways. Uh, but what I, as I began to explore that situation and report on it, uh, the thing that shocked me the most is that is getting to know the community there that had been living with this for decades. Uh, the title of the article I ended up writing, uh, I wrote a lot for the Odessa paper and ultimately did my uh, feature story for the Texas Observer, uh, and we just simply titled the, the Odessa Syndrome. Uh, because the people there who lived, and this is, this is on the south side, it was once the largest petrochemical complex in the country, in, inland petrochemical complex in the country, and, and the people there uh, were well acquainted with the smells of, of the equipment. They felt tremors underground when, when things were stirring. Uh, there were you know constant flu-like symptoms, bloody noses, ear aches, stomach aches. I mean the the whole the whole nine yards. Um, and so uh, the more I heard those stories, the more I started putting together. Well, this is a community that's been uh, relegated because of the history of uh, white supremacy in 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 our in our history. There's a red line, you know, the red line through the segregation years, um, pre-civil rights era and, and beyond, actually, where black and brown folks simply could not live north of the highway. And so where they had to live was where this complex sprouted up. You know, they were there, the complex came, you know, these kind of facilities, they look for cheap land, they look for uh, communities that are politically disenfranchised, where they're looking for an easy way in. Uh, and so what happened, uh, was uh, they were they were trying to bring a new pr product online and they ran into some problems and rather than kind of like turn things down, they, they flared it uh, for two weeks. Uh, it, it happened at a time when we were experiencing what's called a cold air inversion. So all the smoke was trapped low to the ground. There was not a lot of breeze uh, and it just sat on the city, primarily uh, on the south side of town. Um, and this is uh, butadiene, this is benzene, this is arsenic. In one three-hour period, I think, uh, I found a report where they had released 60,000 pounds of ethylene and 30,000 pounds of ethane. Uh, so all told, many of these are known carcinogens, many are suspected, and, and, and many others, uh, I mean, we're talking about leukemia and things like that. So 
Anyway, so reporting on that uh, was pretty remarkable for a number of reasons. One is that you saw the regulatory apparatus fail. I mean, this is TNRCC before the TCQ, the environmental regulator for the state. Their closest office was over 25 miles away. Uh, people would call and complain. They'd show up the next day. Uh, there were an unprecedented at that time 3,100 3, health complaints that were filed uh, prior to the class action lawsuit that ended up delivering, I think, hundred dollars to every person that, that joined uh, and so anyway so, so so that was my initial this is Gene Collins here the head of the NAACP out there for for a long time uh, a really brilliant brilliant man a good organizer um, but I still didn't really know the the foundation the philosophical framework of environmental justice I just knew what I saw um, was not unique, you know, that this was something that uh, was really common. And so when I went on uh, in Mississippi, for instance, uh, there was a, a CB base and all the, the people living around the base, they were living with the residue of Agent Orange. But that was the main port where Agent Orange, the two components that, that created it, uh, were shipped out during Vietnam, and were stored there for many years after, uh, were tanked out to the Gulf and incinerated. Uh, and just, just looking through the record books uh, there, this had not been reported, and I was kind of shocked that, that I was the one to come and bring it, but the Navy had done surveys all around the communities, and they had logged uh, this, uh, particularly one of, one of the effects that would seemingly uh, r relational impact was uh, a, a disproportionate number of children being born with gastroschisis. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but that is when you are born, your organs are on the outside of your body. Um, the, the, the people they went out to canvas for the Navy to survey the families literally uh, had mental health uh, breakdowns, PTSD, trauma, and they couldn't even finish their work. Uh, and so we did a bit of reporting on that. Uh, we looked at the wood treatment plants, and that's chromium, arsenic, and copper, cadmium, I can't believe it's the three that they used to treat, you know, yellow pine and communities where the ditches, they would literally, the company would just dig ditches all through, pe all through the neighborhood to try to funnel it out and kids grow up playing in those ditches. And that was the experience uh, there in, uh, uh, in, in the coast of uh, Mississippi. I heard it over and over again. Um, but the one thing, I, I, I copied a quote here from, from the story, and this is Leroy Reed, who was a longtime South, uh, <coughs> South City resident in Odessa. And he just said, if you go to church or you go to a meeting, anytime you get a crowd of people together, you can learn about it. Uh, it was the Odessa Syndrome. It was just a name the community created. Uh, so that's where I came into it. So. Okay, yeah. And so coming into San Antonio, I, I came here in 2007 and started working at The Current. I was five years at the, the weekly paper here. And many of the early struggles, uh, significant ones, a lot of them revolved around water. Uh, we got into a big one, uh, uh, Alice and Mia, and, and, and as many of you are, are familiar, uh, Wheeler, and, um, and, and uh, it, was, it was remarkable, it was dramatic, um, but it was also framed, I think, really in an energy, it was an energy lens, you know, that we need to move from kind of the toxic fuels onto uh, low carbon technology. Uh, the language of the city at the time, uh, the Express News editorial board uh, do a great job today and have for a few years been editorializing about the crisis, the climate crisis. Uh, for my uh, virtually entire time at The Current, it wasn't a story that was covered. Uh, they certainly didn't editorialize on it. The coverage um, was uh, fairly constricted. The environmental report at the time was a wonderful person, but he was very, very limited in what he could do. So I tried to write that story as much as possible. And yet I kept getting sucked in into uh, very what I would consider kind of technocratic language. We were talking a lot about, well, if we can get energy, you know, uh, buildings as power plants, and if we can just get to solar more quickly, and, you know, and, and, and all these strategies for the city to get the carbon out, then that would kind of resolve, we could address this crisis. Um, but what really wasn't talked about, and what I wasn't queuing in on, was being talked about in circles. Um, but but I, I still found myself kind of sucked into operating by numbers. And my understanding, my response, and the way I speak about climate change, I still use global warming, even though it's uh, some have run away from it in the same way they ran away from the term liberal. 
Um, it accurately describes what is happening right now, which is a crisis today, which is a crisis in our communities. It's not something for our grandchildren. I just want to throw that out there uh, because it's happening much faster than any of these IPC reports can keep up with. Um, so anyway, you know, we, we, we walked into kind of like these development patterns and policies where we heard about certainly uh, after the, the decade, of, decade of downtown was declared 2010, uh, it was a development plan, and, uh, but it was also a development plan to bring money into the inner city and, and rebuild and, 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 and all this. But it was buoyed oftentimes by people who would talk about walkability and people would talk about, um, uh, you know, other, you know, we wanted to bring the cultural creatives in so we needed to have better transportation and, and, it, and it really, uh, so as, and it ended up in some bad places, you know, it was uh, maybe expected in certain corners in the development community, but it was, certainly wasn't promoted. And probably the, the classic uh, case uh, was, uh, was Mission Trails. And I think what happened there has sensitized a lot of people today, so we have reoriented a lot of people that I know and I talk to have expanded their understanding, their interest, and their framing of what an environmental uh, justice struggle is in San Antonio. That, we're not just talking about PPMs anymore, we're talking about human lives. Um, the most exciting vision I've heard since I've been here uh, got totally steamrolled, and that was under Harburger. We had his, uh, uh, Larry Zant, uh, that worked with, with Harburger, uh, used to talk about little, the, his plan for Little Red Schoolhouses. And it was a totally decentralized model to um, take abandoned uh, public schools around the city, uh, turn them into places where the commu that community could learn about uh, urban gardening, where that community could learn about solar and get job skills, green, coll green collar uh, uh, jobs, and um, you know, produce their own community energy, produce their own food, and, and, and really just share ideas and visions for what they want the city and what they want their communities to be like. And we really kind of, uh, kind of shot, shot that over as, as the, the urban plan, the, the CPS plan was, was very much utility scale rather than at a community level. Um, so Mission Trails, I just want to run through some of the numbers and we're going to get back to this and, uh, and talk about uh, how, this, how this ties into environmental struggle. But this is, uh, I don't know, everybody's probably heard of Mission Trails. I don't know how deeply that we're all, we've all read about it, but there is a great uh, report that came out, three years of work, uh, interviewing uh, just everybody that, that could be tracked down during and after the displacement. But this is a 85% Latino, Latina population. Uh, over 55% are, are living on less than $20,000 a year. 43% uh, were primarily Spanish speakers. 51% uh, immigrants, and, and over 45, about 45% were under the age of 18. It was uh, disproportionately uh, women and children uh, that were that were impacted. Uh, and, and the result of that displacement uh, was pretty was pretty startling, you know, and. Um, uh, from the numbers, pulling again from that report by Vecinos de Mission Trails, uh, you see 43% of those who were displaced uh, had to move more than one time. 22%, uh, and we're talking about 300 people, uh, experienced uh, some degree of homelessness. Uh, five households at the time of the interview were still still homeless. Uh, and there was three, three residents, and you know, all of the mental health, the stress, the, uh, definitely the children were heavily impacted with depression and, um, and, and kind of shock. Uh, but there was also several residents who died um, <laughs> shortly, I think, was it was six months, within six months of the well, displacement? Um, two within a year, okay. and the third ends within 18 months. Okay. And, and so what I want to come back to uh, towards the end of the talk is, is what sustainability is we talk about. You know, getting the carbon out, mitigation, we talk about adaptation, preparing our communities, hardening infrastructure, uh, and that sort of thing uh, as, as adaptation. But there's also a social resilience factor, and, and what Mission Trails, I think, demonstrated is, you know, um, so, you, so here's a case where a, a company's come in, they spe have specialized this in our, around the country, where they buy up uh, mobile home parks, uh, uh, underfund, reduce their services, kind of starve the park uh, till it really looks like something like uh, where it can be, where one local media outlet, not the Express, uh, came out and said, oh no, it's good for the good of the community they live because look how they're living. I mean, this is like, this is a public health crisis. They need to be somewhere else. 
Well, that happened. I mean, these people, many of them had been living there for decades, right along the river. They had their relationship with the land. They had a relationship with their neighbors uh, and, and a lifestyle that worked. Uh, and yet, when this company bought them up and starved them of social services, uh, things really did go downhill. And, and it was easy to point uh, for some folks and say, uh, you know, they'd be better off somewhere else. Uh, but when it comes to social cohesion, one story was pretty heartbreaking, and it was a woman that, that I met a, a couple times uh, when I was out there who was uh, experiencing an abusive relationship. Uh, there was a man who was stalking her, that was threatening her, and she had a neighbor who protected her. She had a neighbor who was aware of the situation, uh, a gentleman who lived in the park, and kind of kept, kept that in check. Um, but soon after uh, that displacement, um, she died, I, I believe. Yeah? Yeah, it was actually her, her, her friend, her, uh, like a surrogate daughter who took care of her. Who watched her over. They, they weren't able to move them to the same place. And, right. Um, but she, the older woman continued to live with the abusive housemate. Mm -hmm. And so without the protection of her, her daughter, she, her daughter feels that the, there was elder abuse that played a role in her death. Right, right, right. Uh, thanks for the clarification. Um, so I want to come back to this idea uh, of, of, of social resilience, uh, community resilience as a critical element of climate adaptation uh, because the world we're moving into is, is going to be a much more violent place, a much more challenging place when we talk about the heat buildup in, in the climate right now and projections for uh, you know, summer temperatures uh, within, a, within a few decades. 100 degrees uh, plus highs all summer long. Um, and, and what that does psychologically, what that does uh, physiologically, and how that then, you have to look uh, community-wide and, and think about some of those uh, preparations as well. So. Hi, I'm Cristal Ibarra. I'm the new volunteer coordinator for the Sierra Club Lone Star. That means that I will be working with <laughs> Yay. 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 long time coming <laughs> um, it's a newly created position so there's a lot of productivity um, to go on within groups the the purpose of it is to build capacity with existing groups to get a gauge of what our members that may or may not be present in meetings like these or may not be active beyond the membership what their interests are how can we um, involve them better in a more active uh, role within their spaces and communities. And uh, so I've been here two months. And it's about my third time visiting San Antonio. I think it's one of the closest groups that I have be besides Austin, where it, that's where our main office is located. So I look forward to working with all of you um, in a more you know, one-on-one -on -one manner, connected way. Next week, we, we will be uh, putting up a meeting, so stay tuned for Barbara's uh, <laughs> next steps email. Um, and originally, though, I've been here for three months in Texas. Brand new to Texas. Um, this month has been a one of onboarding, understanding, kind of just sitting back, listening, visiting different groups throughout this huge state. Um, <laughs> Where and, are you from, maybe, yes? Yeah, so originally I'm from Puerto Rico. It's a small island uh, of the Caribbean. <laughs> we are uh, part, of the, part of the United States. Uh, some people uh, refer to us as a territory, others a commonwealth, others a colony. Um, but in general, it's, a, it's, been, it's been home to a lot of environmental injustices. And Greg mentioning and Agent Orange um, talking about Odessa just sparked in me, um, you know, the, the memory of Agent Orange being tested on, on our mountains and leaving that to this day, um, decades after, a lot of them um, being arid and infertile land um, as a result. Uh, speaking of fertility, we were also home to a lot of experimentations with uh, women's contraceptives. Um, we were home to various military bases, some of them closed, others ongoing. A lot of the ones that closed, um, I'd say a little bit too late, um, from resulting of, of cancer to you know, polluted waters, um, beaches, and whatnot. But this is where I grew up. Um, this is my, my childhood home. 
Um, it was in San Juan, Puerto Rico, so the east uh, capital area. It was neighboring the university town. I wouldn't really come in contact with that world, with the botanical gardens, um, until much later in, in my life. Uh, this was kind of a subworld in El Barrio. But I really like this picture because it reminds me of my first direct, ongoing, and constant connection to, to what I would consider nature. And if your first born child would be called Kennedy. Whoa. And it was a woman. <laughs> There's, there she is. Um, but the same way that I, I think about my first connection to nature being that acerola tree, I think about my my first understanding of sustainability as I know it now, on a personal <coughs> level, uh, as my grandmother uh, being the example. Um, you know, if <laughs> I, it's great to read all about sustainability, it's great to read about uh, minimizing your environmental footprint, but for me, what I have to do is think of my grandmother, um, think of her walking everywhere, um, you know, to do her shopping, to go to church. We would walk miles, 40 minutes at a time, an hour at a time uh, just to get places um, and uh, she's a vegan as of she's 87 now <laughs> she <laughs> turned vegan when she was about 84 it was a surprise <laughs> to me <laughs> she loved sweets she loved the candy the Nestle quick like she loved the junk food I'm like she visited me to New York City when I lived there and I'm like okay I need to get her the stuff that I know she likes what do you want for breakfast? Do you want pancakes? Do you want this? No, 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 it's okay. I'll, I'll have an oatmeal with blueberries. <laughs> so she's um, a great example for me that even at, at her age, she's just um, learning and constantly educating herself and going back to, to what we name sustainability. It's probably not her vocabulary, um, but, but to what she feels is, is a right um, way of living and, and minimizing, again, her, her environmental impact. Um, but something I note uh, in reflecting upon this is that her teachings, um, more than verbal, her you know, um, emanation of these things, are very much boiled down to a personal level and to her experience in the community. So sometimes I wonder, would my grandmother had these systems um, that, you know, perpetuated poverty for you know, a struggling teacher with seven children, um, had these systems not been in place, would she have lived the same sustainable lifestyle <laughs> um, that, that she did? You know, was it necessity? Was it obligation? Was it you know, um, personal interest? And I know, I, I trust that it, it's a, a personal thing. She's a very savvy and very connected um, to roots, earth, and, and um, has a lot of reverence for our natural spaces and, and our land, but I'm sure that if she could, in those very hot days, she would have turned on the AC so that her, her children, and her grandchildren would have been a little bit more comfortable. Um, and so it, it just makes me think of, of the systems that are in place um, beyond our personal connections that maybe are perpetuated and we perpetuate without knowing um, on, a, on a daily basis and on an organizational level. Um, and so, with that in mind, it's also something that makes me think about unintended consequences, right? So, how do our actions have an unintended consequence on things that are not necessarily within our scope, within our viewpoints? And um, this is not just uh, Sierra Club, but a lot of environmental organizations um, have had unintended impacts and unintended consequences that might have been um, negatively affecting other people. Uh, so the, the conservationist ethos uh, of, of what environmentalism has been known to be kind of sits and is embedded in this legacy of values um, and naturalist societies of the late 19th and 20th century. So an admiration for the outdoors, which is beautiful, but who has access to that? Were those lands that are now national parks <laughs> always pristine and uninhabitable? And the answer is yes, they were pristine, but they were not uninhabited. You know, there were people living there. There were native um, peoples living there. And, and how did that um, conservation mindset kind of uh, expel people of, of what they knew traditionally as their homes? Um, a lot of times, so I buy used cars. I think it's like my affordable way of minimizing my environmental footprint. 
Um, if I could, I would buy an electric. If I could, I would buy a, a hybrid. But it's not necessarily the case that it's accessible. So this viewpoint that nature um, is, is you know, a commodity or something to, to be aspired and kind of like pristine and untouched or you know, un, un relative to, to the day-to-day, -day, um, this uh, clean technology that is still seen as a luxury because who can really afford um, right. this clean technology? Um, the things that Sierra Club has historically uh, been involved in uh, cap and trade and carbon tax, does everyone know what, what we mean by that? Um, and, and now we see the unintended consequences of those um, things, especially zooming out as we are um, in this you know, globalized market. We, we understand a little bit better the connections um, and the negative consequences that those programs have had. Um, the not in my backyard, who's heard of that? Um, yeah, so if not in mine, if not in yours, then whose? Um, so, so just those things that, that we never necessarily intended to do or that historically environmental organizations never intended to do, um, but there are consequences nevertheless that we uh, learned from. Um, and then, Mary, I don't know if you want to add to the... Um, yeah, I think we, we kind of covered yeah. into to, to mission oh, trails, mission which trails. I just think wasn't in the top of minds, you know, as we were moving through, you know, a decade of downtown and even trying to develop uh, other plans, SA 2020, and we're coming up now on a climate action plan we're going to discuss in a minute, mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the, the values we need to bring to that to make sure that we kind of uh, position these communities and strengthen them to, to get the plan that they need and deserve. Yeah. And so... Who can read our Sierra Club mission statement, just line by line, first line, Barbara? To explore, enjoy, and protect the wild places of the earth. Second line, Hector. Is Hector to practice and promote the responsible use of the earth's ecosystems and its resources. Third, Karen? Me? To educate and enlist humanity to protect and restore the quality of the natural and human environment and to use all, lawful, <laughs> means to carry out these objectives. Yeah, so there's a couple of things to unpack in this last uh, portion. Um, do, do we see the parentheses in the lawful part? <laughs> yeah, do we know why that's uh, placed in parentheses? Michael Brune, our current executive director, um, not just him, but, but the board of directors as well, a couple of years ago decided Hmm, lawful. What if the law is not really, you know, ethical? in accordance, With ethical, the, and in accordance to, to this above. mission statement, <laughs> right? So they uh, decided to um, participate in civil disobedience uh, specifically for the uh, Keystone Pipeline. Yes. Um, and there you go. <laughs> so it's just an important example of how this has transformed. Um, and how can it be transformed and expanded further? No? Uh, educate and enlist humanity. This is interesting to me uh, because when we talk about educating, what education are we um, sharing? You know, um, how are we learning that? How 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 do we uh, allow ourselves to learn as well uh, as an organization? And then um, you'll notice perhaps that human environment is also kind of bolded because mm -hmm. to me it also stands out. What does that even mean uh, to different to different groups to different peoples? Um, is it my acerola tree and my grandma's you know front yard? Is it our na national parks? Is it the urban park um, that's you know within the city limits? So it's uh, just an important thing to kind of note and think about that I um, just always come back to specifically in this in this last portion of Sierra Club's mission statement. Um, and an invitation to kind of maybe explore it a little bit more. So as a result of, of these, um, I guess, uh, thinkings and, and um, reflections, Sierra Club, and if you're interested in, in learning more about their environmental justice program, you can visit the, the link above. Um, they have added. They have added to it, right? It's, it's evolved. So now they want to think about it from the lens of discussing and exploring the linkages between environmental quality and social justice to promote dialogue, increased understanding, and appropriate action. And so there's three uh, main things that if you visit this website, you'll come across. Uh, they have a recently developed 
equity, in justice, and inclusion office that is um, basically dedicated to understanding and rethinking how we as an organization relate to the communities that we are surrounded by, that we interact with, and how we interact with them. So when we talk about equity, we're talking about transcending fairness, and we're saying, hmm, we have to understand if there's a need for equity, um, it's because there's been inequities in the past. So how do we prioritize those people that have been more affected by inequities and injustices and put them at the forefront of, of our um, environmental movement? Uh, justice, again, um, just making sure that we open space in a just way. And inclusion, we talk a lot about, um, uh, and when I say uh, the Sierra Club, um, in, in thinking about this, they think about what is a transactional relationship, you know, like are we going to the bank when we, uh, you know, engage in these strategic campaigns um, and we want to win them and definitely not just want, but we need, we need to make change. We need to um, make sure that, that we protect our environment and our peoples, but is it a transactional relationship that we build with our community or is it a transformational relationship? And just thinking about that when we think about including and um, this specifically, I think, is, is a way to avoid those unintended consequences. No? The more people you have, um, the more perspectives you're open to, the more you're able to at least you know, avoid those unintended consequences because a lot of times it's just, again, us not really seeing what's up um, and, and not seeing other perspectives or not understanding because they're not, you know, they're not what we are um, accompanied by. So all this, <laughs> again, to, to broaden it up, connecting with empathy. And if I ask someone in the room, just for the sake of it, uh, what is empathy? What do we do as empathy? And I don't need like a sentence long, uh, you know, a Wikipedia or a dictionary. Mm. I vow is what I would say. I know. Putting, Putting yourself in another person's place. In another person's place. In another person's place. Was that what you were going to say? Putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Thank okay. you. Being someone else. Being someone else. Yeah. What is not empathy? Yeah. That's well, a developer. <laughs> That's a developer. Well, when you feel sorry for somebody, it's not feeling empathy. It's just feeling, yes, it's, a, it's sympathy, which is not trying to do something about it, it's not transformational, it's just a one-way kind of sentiment mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily show respect to the other person uh, or looks to do something about it. It's just, I'm glad I'm not you. Is <laughs> <laughs> that Chanka? Chanka? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just have a brief list that oh. Empathy Bear is going to share with us. Um, so yeah, it's not sympathy in, in the way that you've defined it, definitely. It's not judgment, it's not blame, it's not withdrawal, but it's also not these things, right? So a lot of times in, when we're thinking of empathizing, we, we want to connect to the point where we feel that maybe sharing our story and putting our story is, uh, is, is going to be that way of, of linking or connecting um, instead of maybe stepping back and listening. Uh, consolation, kind of like what you mentioned as well. Um, advice, like, oh, I feel you, this is what I would do. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really very um, Problem solving, again, or sympathy. And um, these are all things that we can carry with ourselves on a personal level, um, but they can also translate to our work within this organization and, and with our communities. Um, and that's really what we, we want to convey with, with these slides. Yeah, and so one of the things that drew me back into journalism, I stepped away for a little while too. I went back to school. I wanted to look at um, uh, some of these challenges from a, from a global perspective and ended up looking at uh, uh, land struggles and, and such uh, around the world. I looked at, uh, got uh, Nepal, for instance, which had just gone through such a horrible earthquake and, and I think um, you know thousands of deaths. I, I began to find that well, glacier melt uh, actually has the potential to create earthquakes. Uh, there's a, vo vo a 
a fellow down at the London School, I think, volcanologist, and, 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 and really shook me when uh, he described uh, the, these, these, uh, the ability of uh, the extreme expressions of the earth that you don't typically see related to climate change. Um, and, and, and looking at, you know, the carbon banks and around the world, we talked about, you know, how indigenous uh, peoples are impacted. Well, uh, there's the, the history of conservation is one of fortress conservation where the wall goes up, the land has to stay pure, and the people go out. Well, the model was developed here with Yosemite. Uh, and it was, uh, after time, exported to Africa, and it went to Latin America, and it's only been in the last 15 years or so that the large NGOs have invited Native people in to help to plan and to uh, talk about uh, development strategies that also protect the forest, allow uh, carbon sequestration to continue, um, and, and, and empower them in their own land, land, land rights. And so it's been a shift, but it's been a recent shift. Uh, and there's been a lot of people that, that, that have been forced out essentially into refugee camps. Um, uh, the Batwa, for instance, uh, if you try to go and do traditional style hunting and gathering, uh, you're, are, you're in jail, you know, uh, you become a criminal. Um, so, but what inspired me here was really uh, the, some of the movement around Standing Rock, um, uh, the resistance to the, the ETPs, uh, primarily ETP owned pipeline up in Dakota, Dakota Access. Uh, seeing organization around Texas, uh, pipeline organizing in West Texas, um, and, and really just spending time with Native friends, um, doing the sweats, learning the teachings, and standing rock, hearing the prophecies. And I'd really gone over to despair from all the reading on climate, and the bad news, and the bad news, and the bad news. Um, but, uh, and it's probably not for this, um, for this setting, uh, but I heard things that made me feel like, well, okay, these, the things we're fighting for, maybe it's not something I experienced in my lifetime, but I do believe that there is a window into another world, uh, and, and that, is, that, that we are moving towards. This fight is critical. Uh, the win may not be for us, um, but it is for our people and it's for the land, so we, we continue on. And the teachings of right relationship with each other, a right relationship, right relationship with the land are one. The land and people are one. It's one and the same. Uh, so something like Mission Trails, people have been there for decades, they have a relationship with the land, they have a right to continue to have, maintain that relationship uh, and to be bio-real. Uh, so uh, these are some transformative concepts and I think increasingly indigenous people are leading the movement and it's uh, incumbent on us to, to open our ears and to be, uh, to be teachable, right? To have, to, to be changeable, to be malleable and humble. Um, and so, uh, related to climate action in San Antonio, uh, I think that I'm on the correct slide, but we talked about mitigation and adaptation and this idea of social resilience. Um, here in, in San Antonio, we'll get, kind of get into um, the moment now. Uh, when we organized in June, I came in a week later, Trump came up, uh, it was June 1, and said, we're getting out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and right, and, and right, rightly, uh, people rose up. You know, I immediately that day started calling those that I knew and said, are we going downtown? Are we, you know, lifting up our signs? How are we going to handle this? Uh, and it was within a few days that Liz and many of us uh, got together in front of City Hall as of Citizens to be Heard. And ultimately 40 organizations, primarily local, I mean, we have a long history in San Antonio of having Austin coming down, no offense, and, and uh, I guess now me too, I don't know, but, uh, and, and really coming to save the day, you know, we've got Environment Texas and the Sierra Club, you know, State Chapter and, and, and um, Peer and, you know, many others uh, seeing what, and that's fine, but uh, it's really incumbent on, our, on us to make these changes and to stand up. Uh, and so when we got together, the majority of those 40 organizations that signed on within three weeks were local, and they were social justice organizations, they were labor organizations, they were immigrant rights organizations, they were native organizations and peoples, and, um, and all of us, right? And so we stood up to reject Donald Trump, uh, his decision. We stood up for, in favor of international cooperation, uh, and uh, we had two, two requests, and maybe that's on, maybe that's on the next slide. Uh, we wanted our mayor to stand up uh, for the, the, the principles of the Paris Agreement, uh, and we wanted a climate action plan and, and a path to net zero on, on carbon. And yet, my personal message was always, 
yes, stand with Paris, but I'm not talking about the Obama administration's commitment to like a 26% reduction by such a year and this and that and the other. They're not the numbers that I was fighting for. What I was fighting for was the vision of, of cooperation, but also the social justice aspect of it. And a lot of people overlook this, but that document, I'm just going to read from it real quickly. Uh, one of the pre part of the preamble was acknowledging that climate change is a common concern for humankind, that parties should, when taking action to address climate change, respect, promote, and consider our respective obligations on human rights, the right to health, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, migrants, children, and persons with disabilities, uh, people in vulnerable situations, and the right to development, as well as gender equity, the empowerment of women, and intergenerational equity. Um, so this is a major document, and standing with it is, is, is tremendously significant. So the fact that we've done that, even though it's been framed in a particular way, which is, well, uh, we stand for the principles of the Paris Agreement, and we're going to explore the potential benefits of reducing our greenhouse gases. So it, it, it's soft, you know, it's a, you know you're, you're walking through it, and you're, you're on a balloon bounce of just kind of sinking into this language that ultimately to sell, I understand, has to also draw in the business community and say, hey, all is not lost. We've got opportunities in green energy, and it's true. This uh, city can be a bridge to a lot of uh, markets throughout the Americas, and, and, I, and I, I pray that we go that direction. Um, but, but again, um, to talk about uh, the Climate Action Plan, and I think this is probably vital. I know I've mangled up all these slides. Um, but it, it is to talk about social resilience. Um, right now, the city is, is having this conversation about equity, that we, uh, we're talking about integrating the idea of equity into everything this, that, that the city does, which is, which is fairly amazing. I and mean, we've got an opportunity with this council to do tremendous things. Uh, but this climate action plan, from what I understand right now, is not getting the attention, the respect, or the funding proposed that it really needs. And when we go to council and say, we need grassroots uh, driven plan, we need transparency, we need, we, need, uh, uh, we need you to come into the community to solve these problems, it's not going to be the traditional experts in the planning department. We don't need, you know, we, we understand the crisis. But we need the community involvement and the knowledge, the creativity, and the wisdom of people who have lived here for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there is a tremendous capacity there um, that if we don't tap into, uh, that, that we're going to lose. Um, and I would just say that when we talk about extreme heat, we talk about some of, some of these transformations that are coming, the destructive uh, extreme weather and just the right raising temperatures, uh, we have to think also what just the physiological impact of that on the individual, but what does that mean in a neighborhood? What does that mean for the west side as a whole? We know that when the heat goes up, crime goes up. We know that when people can't cool down, they suffer and, and, and end up in the hospital. We know that uh, mental stress and strain takes, takes a toll in many, many ways on the human body, but society, at a society and a cultural level, uh, that's gonna be tremendously destabilizing, and the human suffering involved in that, we're used to talking about the least how, you know, the most vulnerable overseas and the island states and the people in the, the high mountain glacier areas and drought and all this. Well, the most vulnerable communities and those who are most impacted by climate change are here in our neighborhoods. Um, so we not, don't just need the carbon, we just don't need the energy we just, and, the, and the planning, but we need to really get into the social aspects of that. So the fact that the city is talking equity, uh, I really hope we can draw that into, into this project. I really hope we can turn out to these district meetings. Right now, they're, they're putting the budget together. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get left with nothing if we don't demand something. And what we, what, in my opinion, what we need is that for the community to be in leading this process. Otherwise, we end up with another decade of downtown with green dressing. Okay? And, and that's not my vision of a just society. That's not my vision of sustainability. Um, so. Uh, a, a quote, uh, and, and here's just a list I recorded. I'm reading a book right now, Bob Dalpert. He's a trained psychologist, and also he runs a climate uh, sustainability center up, I believe, in, in Minnesota. And he talks about, you know, if you think about as much as we, we want to and we need to invest in opportunity, certainly our communities need jobs, and we need to, 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 to think in terms of, of development. We also need to be realistic. Uh, the, Stern, the Stern Review... On, an, on economics of climate change, uh, uh, Stern, I, I can't remember his full name, but it's Lord Stern, I think. Right. And, and uh, anyway, he's one of the best economists on climate change, and he's projected that within the next 
uh, 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 few years that we'll see a 5% global GDP, GDP decline. And that'll be something that's year after year after year. Uh, food security, drought, uh, our crops failing, monoculture, corn, all of this, water security and scarcity, uh, forced displacement and migration up to a billion people by 2050, and the rise of conflict I mentioned just in our, in, in our communities, um, heat-driven violence. Um, and, and really it's the hopelessness that, 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 that follows uh, and, and we can expect, uh, which also opens up and feeds the rise of despots. To tell you the truth, people lose all hope, they need somebody to come in, and they need things fixed. And that's the polarization we have now, I would anticipate, would, would only increase if we just don't really get into the game. And so the quote from Bob, I, I know we need, to move, we need to move through this and respect your time and open up conversation, but his position is that no response to the climate crisis will succeed unless individuals and groups of all types around the globe understand how trauma and toxic stress affects their minds, their bodies, and, you, and are able to use skills to calm their emotions and thoughts, learn from and find meaning and direction and hope in adversity. Um, so it's kind of mind-boggling in, in, in a community as, as poor and, and stressed already as San Antonio, how we're going to get the investment uh, into the, the social investment into San Antonio. But I think it also it has to find expression in the work that we do within the CR Club and our partner organizations. Uh, we did bring a video. Uh, if you guys are interested, we just got back from the border. Uh, it's about 13 minutes. Uh, I, I filmed some of the march, and we talked to some of those uh, that were marching. And if you want to do that, we can do that, or we can just go straight into discussion, because I know we've, we're at 7.30 now, and, and folks need to get moving. Um, it's up to you guys. Let's do that. Movie. Yeah. 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 We have people here who are, want to get involved in this. So. Yeah, oh, why sorry. don't you give them a quick um, yeah. Yeah. why we were there. Kind of. Yeah, so <laughs> lately, um, who's ever spoken with Jerome, our administrative assistant? No? Yeah, all right. So lately, Jerome, he's retiring, by the way, but um, he's been with us for decades. Um, but Jerome is getting a lot of calls of people asking, why is the Sierra Club involving itself in talks about the wall? <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> and it's people that are members. And, yeah, yeah. and it's people that are members that don't necessarily, um, have ma haven't necessarily made the connections um, specifically with this uh, area that is that is proposed, um, which would cut the, the Rio Grande and the, the Santa Ana Wildlife National Refuge, basically just like cut it, uh, interrupt migration patterns for the butterfly, for the river, other animals, for the people that are just used to interacting with each other across the river. Um, and so that is something that we're currently um, dealing with, you know? We, we are getting these calls. We are getting these calls of people that have not necessarily made the connections, members that have dedicated um, themselves to, to Sierra Club and, and are just wondering why is it that Sierra Club is involving itself in talks about the wall. And so we participated in a weekend of resistance um, of, against the proposed border wall um, in Mission, Texas. And the, the first part, Saturday, was just a procession uh, along the town. Um, a lot of people uh, showed up, about 500 people, which was the, the targeted um, amount. And, and then the next day, we had a visit to the actual Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge, uh, so people could just, um, you know, visit and understand and situate themselves in the land. Um, that, that so many uh, neighbors and, and community members have historically um, been, been deep rooted in. And so this is just uh, some, some excerpts. We're not going to play the whole 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> we're just going to give you a vibe and a feel, and, and I'm sure Greg can show yeah, you. Yeah, we can, we can get um, into that. But yeah, so, so the second day, there were um, 700 people. That we counted. Oh, wow. I walked. Some of you that were in earlier, uh, we played just without sounds. Kind of, I walked along the levee where the wall would be, which cuts across the top of the the refuge. Uh, it took me seven minutes 
to walk along this chain of people holding hands and in this video, get that one clip. Uh, really remarkable. They're walking uh, right now to uh, Lomita Mission, which is uh, the, the little, uh, the, the mission uh, right by the river that gave Mission Texas its name, which also would be walled off and kind of ceded to kind of a, a no man's land. So here we began the procession through Mission. And these are like really badass priests that are being <laughs> this vehicle carrying the birthday. This is not us and making music. 